War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Thirty Six, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. Prince Andrew's regiment was among the reserves which, till after one o'clock, were stationed inactive behind Semenovsk under heavy artillery fire. Toward two o'clock, the regiment, having already lost more than two hundred men, was moved forward into a trampled outfield in the gap between Semenovsk and the Knoll Battery, where thousands of men perished that day, and on which an intense concentrated fire from several hundred enemy guns was directed between one and two o'clock. Without moving from that spot, or firing a single shot, the regiment here lost another third of its men. From in front, and especially from the right, in the unlifting smoke, the guns boomed, and out of the mysterious domain of smoke that overlay the whole space in front, quick hissing cannon walls and slow whistling shells flew unceasingly. At times, as if to allow them a respite, a quarter of an hour passed, during which the cannonballs and shells all flew overhead. But sometimes several men were torn from the regiment in a minute, and the slain were continually being dragged away and the wounded carried off. With each fresh blow, less and less chance of life remained for those not yet killed. The regiment stood in columns of battalion, three hundred paces apart, but nevertheless the men were always in one and the same mood. All alike were taciturn and morose. Talk was rarely heard in the ranks, and it ceased altogether every time the thud of a successful shot and the cry of stretchers was heard. Most of the time, by their officer's order, the men sat on the ground. One having taken off his shako, carefully loosened the gutters of its lining and drew them tight again. Another, rubbing some dry clay between his palms, polished his bayonet. Another fingered the strap and pulled the buckle of his bandolier, while another smoothed and refolded his leg bands and put his boots on again. Some built little houses of the tufts in the ploughed ground, or plated baskets from the straw in the cornfield. All seemed fully absorbed in these pursuits. When men were killed or wounded, when rows of stretchers went past, when some troops retreated, and when great masses of the enemy came into view through the smoke, no one paid any attention to these things. But when our artillery or cavalry advanced, or some of our infantry were seen to move forward, words of approval were heard on all sides. But the liveliest attention was attracted by occurrences quite apart from and unconnected with the battle. It was as if the minds of these morally exhausted men found relief in everyday commonplace occurrences. A battery of artillery was passing in front of the regiment. The horse of an ammunition cart put its leg over a trace. Hey, look at the trace horse. Get her leg out. She'll fall. Ah, oh, they don't see it came identical shouts from the ranks all along the regiment. Another time, general attention was attracted by a small brown dog, coming heaven knows whence, which trotted in a preoccupied manner in front of the ranks, with tail stiffly erect, till suddenly a shell fell close by, when it yelped, tucked its tail between its legs, and darted aside. Yells and shrieks of laughter rose from the whole regiment. But such distractions lasted only a moment, and for eight hours the men had been inactive, without food, in constant fear of death, 
and their pale and gloomy faces grew even paler and gloomier. Prince Andrew, pale and gloomy, like everyone in the regiment, paced up and down from the border of one patch to another, at the edge of the meadow beside an oat field, with head bowed and arms behind his back. There was nothing for him to do, and no orders to be given. Everything went on off itself. The killed were dragged from the front, the wounded carried away, and the ranks closed up. If any soldiers ran to the rear, they returned immediately and hastily. At first, Prince Andrew, considering it his duty to rouse the courage of the men and to set them an example, walked about among the ranks. But he soon became convinced that this was unnecessary and that there was nothing he could teach them. All the powers of his soul, as of every soldier there, were unconsciously bent on avoiding the contemplation of the horrors of their situation. He walked along the meadow, dragging his feet, rustling the grass, and gazing at the dust that covered his boots. Now he took big strides, trying to keep to the footprints left on the meadow by the mowers, then he counted his steps, calculating how often he must walk from one strip to another to walk a mile. Then he stripped the flowers from the wormwood that grew along a boundary rut, rubbed them in his palms, and smelled their pungent, sweetly bitter scent. Nothing remained of the previous day's thoughts. He thought of nothing. He listened with weary ears to the ever-recurring sounds distinguishing the whistle of flying projectiles from the booming of the reports, glanced at the tiresomely familiar faces of the men of the 1st Battalion and waited. Here it comes. This one is coming our way again, he thought, listening to an approaching whistle in the hidden region of smoke. One, another, again, it has hit. He stopped and looked at the ranks. No, it has gone over, but this one has hit. And again he started trying to reach the boundary strip in sixteen paces. A whiz and a thud. Five paces from him, a cannonball tore up the dry earth and disappeared. A chill ran down his back. Again he glanced at the ranks. Probably many had been hit. A large crowd had gathered near the second battalion. Adjutant, he shouted, order them not to crowd together. The adjutant, having obeyed this instruction, approached Prince Andrew. From the other side, a battalion commander rode up. Look out! came a frightened cry from a soldier, and like a bird whirring in rapid flight and alighting on the ground, a shell dropped with little noise within two steps of Prince Andrew and close to the battalion commander's horse. The horse, first regardless of whether it was right or wrong to show fear, snorted, reared almost throwing the major, and galloped aside. The horse's terror infected the man. Lie down, cried the adjutant, throwing himself flat on the ground. Prince Andrew hesitated. The smoking shell spun like a top between him and the prostrate adjutant, near a wormwood plant between the field and the meadow. Can this be death? thought Prince Andrew, looking with a quite new envious glance at the grass, the wormwood, and the streamlet of smoke that curled up from the rotating black ball. I cannot, I do not wish to die. I love life, I love this grass, this earth, this air. He thought this and at the same time remembered that people were looking at him. It is shameful, sir, he said to the adjutant. What? 
he did not finish speaking. At one and the same moment came the sound of an explosion, a whistle of splinters as from a breaking window frame, a suffocating smell of powder, and Prince Andrew started to one side, raising his arm and fell on his chest. Several officers ran up to him. From the right side of his abdomen, blood was welling out, making a large stain on the grass. The militiamen with stretchers who were called up stood behind the officers. Prince Andrew lay on his chest with his face in the grass, breathing heavily and noisily. What are you waiting for? Come along! The peasants went up and took him by his shoulders and legs, but he moaned piteously, and exchanging looks, they set him down again. Pick him up! Lift him! It is all the same, cried someone. They again took him by the shoulders and laid him on the stretcher. Oh, God, my God, what is it? The stomach, that means death, my God, voices among the officers were heard saying. It flew a hair's breadth past my ear, said the adjutant. The peasants, adjusting the stretcher to their shoulders, started hurriedly along the path they had trodden down to the dressing station. Keep in step! Oh, those peasants! shouted an officer, seizing by their shoulders and checking the peasants who were walking unevenly and jolting the stretcher. Get into step, Fedor! I say, Fedor! said the foremost peasant. Now that is right, said the one behind joyfully when he had got into step. Your Excellency, eh, Prince, said the trembling voice of Timokin, who had run up and was looking down on the stretcher. Prince Andrew opened his eyes and looked up at the speaker from the stretcher into which his head had sunk deep, and again his eyelids drooped. The militiaman carried Prince Andrew to the dressing station by the wood, where wagons were stationed. The dressing station consisted of three tents with flaps turned back, pitched at the edge of a birch wood. In the wood, wagons and horses were standing. The horses were eating oats from the movable troughs, and sparrows flew down and pecked the grains that fell. Some crows, scenting blood, flew among the birch trees, cawing impatiently. Around the tents, over more than five acres, blood-stained men in various garbs stood, sat, or lay. Around the wounded stood crowds of soldier stretcher-bearers, with dismal and attentive faces, whom the officers, keeping order, tried in vain to drive from the spot. Disregarding the officers' orders, the soldiers stood leaning against their stretchers and gazing intently, as if trying to comprehend the difficult problem of what was taking place before them. From the tents came now loud angry cries, now plaintive groans. Occasionally, dressers ran out to fetch water, or to point out those who were to be brought in next. The wounded men awaiting their turn outside the tents groaned, sighed, wept, screamed, swore, or asked for vodka. Some were delirious. Prince Andrew's bearers, stepping over the wounded who had not yet been bandaged, took him as a regimental commander close up to one of the tents and there stopped awaiting instructions. Prince Andrew opened his eyes and for a long time could not make out what was going on around him. He remembered the meadow, the wormwood, the field, the whirling black ball, and his sudden rush of passionate love of life. Two steps from him, leaning against a branch and talking loudly, and attracting general attention stood a tall, handsome, black-haired, non-commissioned officer with a bandaged head. 
He had been wounded in the head and leg by bullets. Around him, eagerly listening to his talk, a crowd of wounded and stretcher-bearers were gathered. We kicked him out from there so that he chucked everything. We grabbed the king himself, cried he, looking around him with eyes that glittered with fever. If only reserves had come up just then, lads, there wouldn't have been nothing left of him. I tell you, surely. Like all the others near the speaker, Prince Andrew looked at him with shining eyes and experienced a sense of comfort. But isn't it all the same now, thought he? And what will be there? And what has there been here? Why was I so reluctant to part with life? There was something in this life I did not and do not understand. End of chapter 36 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 37 Read for LibriVox.org by David Anton One of the doctors came out of the tent in a blood-stained apron, holding a cigar between the thumb and little finger of one of his small, blood-stained hands, so as not to smear it. He raised his head and looked about him, but above the level of the wounded men. He evidently wanted a little respite. After turning his head from right to left for some time, he sighed and looked down. All right, immediately, he replied to a dresser who pointed Prince Andrew out to him, and he told them to carry him into the tent. Murmurs arose among the wounded who were waiting. It seems that even in the next world only the gentry are to have a chance, remarked one. Prince Andrew was carried in and laid on a table that had only just been cleared, and which a dresser was washing down. Prince Andrew could not make out distinctly what was in that tent. The pitiful groans from all sides and the torturing pain in his thigh, stomach, and back distracted him. All he saw about him merged into a general impression of naked, bleeding human bodies that seemed to fill the whole of the low tent, as a few weeks previously on that hot August day such bodies had filled the dirty pond beside the Smolensk road. Yes, it was the same flesh, the same Sheral Canon, the sight of which had even then filled him with horror, as by a presentiment. There were three operating tables in the tent. Two were occupied, and on the third they placed Prince Andrew. For a little while he was left alone and involuntarily witnessed what was taking place on the other two tables. On the nearest one sat a Tartar, probably a Cossack, judging by the uniform thrown down beside him. Four soldiers were holding him, and a spectacled doctor was cutting into his muscular brown back. Oh, oh, oh! grunted the Tartar, and suddenly lifting up his swarthy, snub-nosed face with its high cheekbones and baring his white teeth, he began to wriggle and twitch his body and utter piercing, ringing, and prolonged yells. On the other table, round which many people were crowding, a tall, well-fed man lay on his back with his head thrown back. His curly hair, its color, and the shape of his head seemed strangely familiar to Prince Andrew. Several dressers were pressing on his chest to hold him down. One large, white, plump leg twitched rapidly all the time with a feverish tremor. The man was sobbing and choking convulsively. Two doctors, one of whom was pale and trembling, were silently doing something to this man's other gory leg. When he had finished with the tartar, whom they covered with an overcoat, the spectacled doctor came up to Prince Andrew, wiping his hands. He glanced at Prince Andrew's face and quickly turned away. "'Undress him! What are you waiting for?' he cried angrily to the dressers. His very first, remotest recollections of childhood came back to Prince Andrew's mind when the dresser with sleeves rolled up, began hastily to undo the buttons of his clothes, and undress him. 
The doctor bent down over the wound, felt it, and sighed deeply. Then he made a sign to someone, and the torturing pain in his abdomen caused Prince Andrew to lose consciousness. When he came to himself, the splintered portions of his thigh bone had been extracted, the torn flesh cut away, and the wound bandaged. Water was being sprinkled on his face. As soon as Prince Andrew opened his eyes, the doctor bent over, kissed him silently on the lips, and hurried away. After the sufferings he had been enduring, Prince Andrew enjoyed a blissful feeling such as he had not experienced for a long time. All the best and happiest moments of his life, especially his earliest childhood when he used to be undressed and put to bed, and when, leaning over him, his nurse sang him to sleep, and he, burying his head in his pillow, felt happy in the mere consciousness of life, returned to his memory, not merely as something past, but as something present. The doctors were busily engaged with the wounded man, the shape of whose head seemed familiar to Prince Andrew. They were lifting him up and trying to quiet him. "'Show it to me!' "'Oh, oh, oh, oh!' His frightened moans could be heard, subdued by suffering and broken by sobs. Hearing those moans, Prince Andrew wanted to weep. Whether because he was dying without glory or because he was sorry to part with life, or because of those memories of a childhood that could not return, or because he was suffering and others were suffering and that man near him was groaning so piteously, he felt like weeping childlike, kindly, and almost happy tears. The wounded man was shown his amputated leg, stained with clotted blood and with the boot still on. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, f f he sobbed like a woman. The doctor, who had been standing beside him, preventing Prince Andrew from seeing his face, moved away. My God, what is this? Why is he here? said Prince Andrew to himself. In the miserable, sobbing, enfeebled man, whose leg had just been amputated, he recognized Anatole Kirajin. Men were supporting him in their arms and offering him a glass of water, but his trembling, swollen lips could not grasp its rim. Anatole was sobbing painfully. Yes, it is he. Yes, that man is somehow closely and painfully connected with me, thought Prince Andrew, not yet clearly grasping what he saw before him. What is the connection of that man with my childhood and my life? he asked himself without finding an answer. And suddenly, a new unexpected memory from that realm of pure and loving childhood presented itself to him. He remembered Natasha as he had seen her for the first time at the ball in 1810, with her slender neck and arms, and with a frightened happy face ready for rapture, and love and tenderness for her, stronger and more vivid than ever, awoke in his soul. He now remembered the connection that had existed between himself and this man who was dimly gazing at him through tears that filled his swollen eyes. He remembered everything, and ecstatic pity and love for that man overflowed his happy heart. Prince Andrew could no longer restrain himself and wept tender loving tears for his fellow men, for himself, and for his own and their errors compassion, love of our brothers, for those who love us and for those who hate us, love of our enemies. Yes, that love which God preached on earth and which Princess Mary taught me and I did not understand, that is what made me sorry to part with life. That is what remained for me had I lived. But now it is too late. I know it. End of chapter 37
produced an unexpected impression on Napoleon, who usually liked to look at the killed and wounded, thereby, he considered, testing his strength of mind. This day, the horrible appearance of the battlefield overcame that strength of mind which he thought constituted his merit and his greatness. He rode hurriedly from the battlefield, and returned to the Chevardino Knoll, where he sat on his camp-stool, his sallow face swollen and heavy, his eyes dim, his nose red, and his voice hoarse, involuntarily listening, with downcast eyes, to the sounds of firing. With painful dejection he awaited the end of this action, in which he regarded himself as a participant, and which he was unable to arrest. A personal, human feeling, for a brief moment, got the better of the artificial phantasm of life he had served so long. He felt in his own person the sufferings and death he had witnessed on the battlefield. The heaviness of his head and chest reminded him of the possibility of suffering and death for himself. At that moment he did not desire Moscow, or victory, or glory. What need had he for any more glory? The one thing he wished for was rest, tranquillity, and freedom. But when he had been on the Semenovsk heights, the artillery commander had proposed to him to bring several batteries of artillery up to those heights to strengthen the fire on the Russian troops crowded in front of Knyaskovo. Napoleon had assented, and had given orders that news should be brought to him of the effect those batteries produced. An adjutant came now to inform him that the fire of two hundred guns had been concentrated on the Russians, as he had ordered, but that they still held their ground. "'Our fire is mowing them down by rows, but still they hold on,' said the adjutant. "'They want more,' said Napoleon, in a hoarse voice. "'Sire?' asked the adjutant, who had not heard the remark. "'They want more,' croaked Napoleon, frowning. "'Let them have it.' Even before he gave that order, the thing he did not desire, and for which he gave the order only because he thought it was expected of him, was being done, and he fell back into that artificial realm of imaginary greatness, and again, as a horse walking a treadmill thinks it is doing something for itself, he submissively fulfilled the cruel, sad, gloomy, and inhuman role predestined for him. And not for that day and hour alone, were the mind and conscience darkened of this man, on whom the responsibility for what was happening lay more than on all the others who took part in it. Never to the end of his life could he understand goodness, beauty, or truth, or the significance of his actions, which were too contrary to goodness and truth, too remote from everything human, for him ever to be able to grasp their meaning. He could not disavow his actions, be lauded as they were by half the world, and so he had to repudiate truth, goodness, and all humanity. Not only on that day, as he rode over the battlefield strewn with men killed and maimed, by his will, as he believed, did he reckon, as he looked at them, how many Russians there were for each Frenchman, and, deceiving himself, find reason for rejoicing in the calculation that there were five Russians for every Frenchman. Not on that day alone did he write in a letter to Paris that the battlefield was superb, because fifty thousand corpses lay there, but even on the island of St. Helena, in the peaceful solitude where he said he intended to devote his leisure to an account of the great deeds he had done, he wrote, The Russian war should have been the most popular war of modern times. It was a war of good sense, for real interests, for the tranquillity and security of all, it was purely pacific and conservative. It was a war for a great cause, the end of uncertainties and the beginning of security. A new horizon and new labours were opening out, full of well-being and prosperity for all. The European system was already founded. All that remained was to organise it. Satisfied on these great points, and with tranquillity everywhere, I too should have had my Congress and my Holy Alliance, those ideas were stolen from me. In that reunion of great sovereigns we should have discussed our interests like one family, and have rendered account to the peoples as clerk to master. Europe would in this way soon have been, in fact, but one people, and any one who travelled anywhere would have found himself always in the common fatherland. I should have demanded the freedom of all navigable rivers for everybody, that the seas should be common to all, and that the great standing armies should be reduced henceforth to mere guards for the sovereigns. 
on returning to France to the bosom of the great, strong, magnificent, peaceful, and glorious fatherland, I should have proclaimed her frontiers immutable, all future wars purely defensive, all aggrandizement anti-national. I should have associated my son in the empire, my dictatorship would have been finished, and his constitutional reign would have begun. Paris would have been the capital of the world, and the French the envy of the nations. My leisure then, and my old age, would have been devoted, in company with the Empress and during the royal apprenticeship of my son, to leisurely visiting, with our own horses and like a true country couple, every corner of the empire, receiving complaints, redressing wrongs, and scattering public buildings and benefactions on all sides and everywhere. Napoleon, predestined by Providence for the gloomy role of executioner of the peoples, assured himself that the aim of his actions had been the people's welfare, and that he could control the fate of millions, and by the employment of power confer benefactions. Of four hundred thousand who crossed the Vistula, he wrote further of the Russian war, half were Austrians, Prussians, Saxons, Poles, Bavarians, Württembergers, Mecklenburgers, Spaniards, Italians, and Neapolitans. The imperial army, strictly speaking, was one-third composed of Dutch, Belgians, men from the borders of the Rhine, Piedmontese, Swiss, Givanese, Tuscans, Romans, inhabitants of the 32nd Military Division, of Bremen, of Hamburg, and so on. It included scarcely a hundred and forty thousand who spoke French. The Russian expedition actually cost France less than fifty thousand men. The Russian army in its retreat from Vilna to Moscow lost in the various battles four times more men than the French army. The burning of Moscow cost the lives of a hundred thousand Russians who died of cold and want in the woods. Finally, in its march from Moscow to the Oder, the Russian army also suffered from the severity of the season, so that by the time it reached Vilna it numbered only fifty thousand, and at Kalish less than eighteen thousand. He imagined that the war with Russia came about by his will, and the horrors that occurred did not stagger his soul. He boldly took the whole responsibility for what happened, and his darkened mind found justification in the belief that among the hundreds of thousands who perished there were fewer Frenchmen than Hessians and Bavarians. End of chapter 38《Book Ten, Chapter Thirty Nine, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Several tens of thousands of the slain lay in diverse postures and various uniforms on the fields and meadows belonging to the Davidov family and to the Crown serfs. Those fields and meadows where, for hundreds of years, the peasants of Borodino, Gorky, Shevardino, and Semenovsk had reaped their harvests and pastured their cattle. At the dressing stations the grass and earth were soaked with blood for a space of some three acres around. Crowds of men of various arms, wounded and unwounded, with frightened faces, dragged themselves back to Mozhaisk from the one army and back to Valuevo from the other. Other crowds, exhausted and hungry, went forward, led by their officers. Others held their ground and continued to fire. Over the whole field, previously so gaily beautiful with a glitter of bayonets and cloudlets of smoke in the morning sun, there now spread a mist of damp and smoke and a strange acid smell of saltpeter and blood. Clouds gathered, and drops of rain began to fall on the dead and wounded, on the frightened, exhausted, and hesitating men, as if to say, Enough, men, enough! Seize, bethink yourselves, what are you doing? To the men of both sides alike, worn out by want of food and rest, it began equally to appear doubtful whether they should continue to slaughter one another. All the faces expressed hesitation, and the question arose in every soul, For what, for whom, must I kill and be killed? You may go and kill whom you please, but I don't want to do so any more. By evening this thought had ripened in every soul. At any moment these men might have been seized with horror at what they were doing, and might have thrown up everything and run away anywhere. But, though toward the end of the battle the men felt all the horror of what they were doing, though they would have been glad to leave off, some incomprehensible, mysterious power continued to control them, and they still brought up the charges, 
loaded, aimed, and applied the match, though only one artilleryman survived out of every three, and though they stumbled and panted with fatigue, perspiring and stained with blood and powder. The cannonballs flew just as swiftly and cruelly from both sides, crushing human bodies, and that terrible work, which was not done by the will of a man, but at the will of him who governs men and worlds, continued. Anyone looking at the disorganized rear of the Russian army would have said that, if only the French made one more slight effort, it would disappear. And anyone looking at the rear of the French army would have said that the Russians need only make one more slight effort, and the French would be destroyed. But neither the French nor the Russians made that effort, and the flame of battle burned slowly out. The Russians did not make that effort, because they were not attacking the French. At the beginning of the battle they stood blocking the way to Moscow, and they still did so at the end of the battle, as at the beginning. But even had the aim of the Russians been to drive the French from their positions, they could not have made this last effort, for all the Russian troops had been broken up. There was no part of the Russian army that had not suffered in the battle, and though still holding their positions, they had lost one half of their army. The French, with the memory of all their former victories during fifteen years, with the assurance of Napoleon's invincibility, with the consciousness that they had captured part of the battlefield and had lost only a quarter of their men, and still had their guards intact, twenty thousand strong, might easily have made that effort. The French had attacked the Russian army in order to drive it from its position, ought to have made that effort, for as long as the Russians continued to block the road to Moscow as before, the aim of the French had not been attained, and all their efforts and losses were in vain. But the French did not make that effort. Some historians say that Napoleon need only have used his old guards who were intact, and the battle would have been won. To speak of what would have happened had Napoleon sent his guards is like talking of what would happen if autumn became spring. It could not be. Napoleon did not give his guards, not because he did not want to, but because it could not be done. All the generals, officers, and soldiers of the French army knew it could not be done, because the flagging spirit of the troops would not permit it. It was not Napoleon alone who had experienced that nightmare feeling of the mighty arm being stricken powerless, but all the generals and soldiers of his army, whether they had taken part in the battle or not, after all their experience of previous battles, when after one-tenth of such efforts the enemy had fled, experienced a similar feeling of terror before an enemy who, after losing half his men, stood as threateningly at the end as at the beginning of the battle. The moral force of the attacking French army was exhausted. Not that sort of victory which is defined by the capture of pieces of material fastened to sticks, called standards, and of the ground on which the troops had stood and were standing, but a moral victory that convinces the enemy of the moral superiority of his opponent and of his own impotence, was gained by the Russians at Borodino. The French invaders, like an infuriated animal that has in its onslaught received a mortal wound, felt that they were perishing, but could not stop, any more than the Russian army, weaker by one half, could help swerving. By impetus gained, the French army was still able to roll forward to Moscow, but there, without further effort on the part of the Russians, it had to perish bleeding from the mortal wound it had received at Borodino. The direct consequence of the Battle of Borodino was Napoleon's senseless flight from Moscow, his retreat along the old Smolensk road, the destruction of the invading army of five hundred thousand men, and the downfall of Napoleonic France, on which, at Borodino, for the first time, the hand of an opponent of stronger spirit had been laid. End of chapter 39 End of War and Peace, Book 10, by Leo Tolstoy. This recording is in the public domain.